This is Literature Out Loud at Delnavert Museum, The Extrasodes. Speaking with me today is Dr. Christopher Keep, who is the Associate Professor of English at Western University, and he is an Associate Professor um, and Director of the Film Studies Program. Um, he's also the editor of the Victorian Review. Welcome and thank you so much for talking with me today. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for asking. So, the time machine. Mm -hmm. We've just begun our foray into um, this H.G. Wells classic, and um, we have one episode released. It includes chapters one and two. And so, um, I just want to start our discussion with maybe the idea of time travel mm. and uh, the possibility of time travel. And because this was um, a novel written in the Victorian time period, and this is your specialty, mm -hmm. was this a common theme of Victorian literature? Was this a topic that was maybe debated in um, scientific circles? Right, good, good question. So The Time Machine comes out in 1895, uh, and that's a propitious moment. It's better part of 40 years after uh, Darwin's Origin of Species, and we're coming up to the turn of a, a millennium, turn of a century. Um, and because of those things, it's going to give the Victorians a real fascination with the idea of time itself. So the Victorians were obsessed with time. They were partly obsessed with time in the sense of history. So in the 19th century, after the Bible, what's the most popular book? The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which many people would find a fairly dry historical analysis of, of an ancient civilization. But the Victorians are fascinated by history. And this is very common that um, history books during this period would prove extraordinarily popular. And that's in part because the Victorians are struggling with the very idea of time itself. They had been told by their churches that time was uh, th thought of in historical terms was a relatively finite quantity that in fact you could probably even as one famously one uh, English clergyman did you could probably go to the Bible and actually figure out the day that the universe was created and that was about maybe 12,000 years it wasn't that long a span of time that they assumed creation uh, occupied. Mm. But in the 1830s, a geologist named Charles Lyell had been studying uh, sedimentary patterns and coastlines and had begun to begin to uh, develop a theory that what we see around us, that the world that we observe, particularly the natural world we see about us, it may in fact be not so much the work of some divine architect's hand, what if what we're looking at is in fact mostly the accidental residue of very small scale forces like, like the lapping of waves on a shore or the movement of wind in the air? What if those extremely subtle forces but acting over vast periods of time had little by little, grain of sand by grain of sand, had shaped the world we see around us? And as he began to explore this idea that you could account for much of our world by reference to not miracles, but to everyday common small scale forces occurring over vast stretches of time, this becomes a kind of obsession. He begins to find the evidence for it. And he begins to understand that you can find the evidence for it on any beach in England. Go down to the beach and go dig up the fossils. And you begin to unearth what is essentially a kind of ancient history, perhaps even in a history that predates human history. Lyle's concept of what becomes known as deep time, deep mm. history, the sense that the earth is not thousands of years old, but perhaps millions, perhaps billions of years old. And that what we see around us is not the, the result of a miraculous intervention in nature, but is in fact nothing but nature's own mechanical forces operating on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, it begins a kind of an, a popular obsession during this period because now you can start thinking of history in these much expanded time frames. Mm -hmm. Charles Darwin comes along in the 1850s. He actually takes Lyle's book on geology. He takes books, Lyle's book on geology, and it's one of the few books he takes on the HMS Beagle with him when he goes off to South America to study parakeets and tortoises. One book he has, or one of the books he has in his hands, is Lyle's book. Mm -hmm. And what he does there is he starts to thinking, well, 
what if what Lyle says about English coastlines in which ordinary forces, very small scale forces operating over large periods of time, what if that's also the, what's happening in biology with species? That what we see around us isn't maybe God's divine intuition of what a parakeet should look like. What if it's simply the process of, I need a phrase for it, how about natural selection? What if those forces operating from generation to generation, tiny deviation to tiny deviation, amplified over vast scales of time, what if everything we see about us in the living world is also an effect of those things? So the Victorians are having to confront the idea of vast time scales in a way that no earlier generation had to. And one of the ways that they confront that, that dilemma of thinking about the vastness of time and the smallness of human place in that time is through the narrative of history. Telling stories about ancient civilizations becomes a way to make time understandable, livable, endurable, makes it, makes it human in a sense. From all of that, you start getting this fascination with time, particularly in the, in the sense of the time of the past. Mm -hmm. Now the future is a different thing. The, con the concept of the future, the concern for the future that you see in the time machine, it's coming from a different place. It's coming from arguments around, oddly enough, around steam engines and heat dissipation. And what physicists who are interested in steam and heat and energy begin to develop a theory that we now call the second law of thermodynamics, or what we sometimes know as the law of entropy. And what they come to understand is that it may well be the case that energy tends to dissipate over time in exactly the same way that a steam engine's boiler will gradually cool over time. And that maybe the entire universe is a giant cooling steam engine gradually running down. Oh, okay. And that this is no accident, but this is actually the law of natural forces that energy tends towards a minimum and entropy tends towards a maximum in any closed system. And that's the law. That's Helmholtz's second law of thermodynamics. And that's phrased in 1852. And so you've got this new fascination for the first time with the idea of uh, speculating about the future and that the future is a gradual running down of time. And so one of the ways that they begin to think about the law of thermodynamics, one of the popular ways in which the law of thermodynamics is discussed in the press and in literature of the period is to talk about what was called the heat death of the universe. Mm. So that when people looked at the sun, they had to realize that the sun was gradually burning itself out. That what you were looking at on those lovely summer days like today is, is you're witnessing and bearing witness to the gradual dissolution of all energy. That's why it's so warm. Yeah. Um, and so you begin now in the uh, latter half of the 19th century, this time that it, this period that is so fascinated by time with deep history, now becomes fascinated with the prospect of a deep future. And that that deep future is not going to be the culmination of the English civilization, but will eventually find that even the English civilization will be overtaken by these large cosmic forces. At some point, the sun will die out. So that's what Wells is picking up on. Wow. He's fascinated by time and the idea of time. In some ways, the Victorians were using narrative. Every history book is in some senses a time machine, like your museum is a kind of time machine. It was permitting people to travel to earlier times. Wells is flipping that around and thinking about whether or not we could not just explore the past as we do through history books and museums, what if we could explore the future? And he knows, because he's a well-educated young man in science, he knows that the deep future is the death of the sun itself. Okay. So that uh, that brings me to wonder, not who is H.G. Wells, but kind of, like what was his education in science? He said he was a um, well-educated young man. Um, was his education mostly focused in science or, or is that his specialty? Or what can you tell us about Wells? Mm, it's a good question, uh, and such a fascinating question, and such an interesting uh, window onto um, the 19th century, and particularly educational opportunities. Herbert George Wells, he was born in 1866. Mm -hmm. 
and his father, uh, an unsuccessful gardener, an unsuccessful shopkeeper, and a kind of only marginally successful semi-professional cricketer who then broke a leg and had to give up even his cricketing career. Oh my goodness. His mom, um, a former domestic servant, she had been a maid. Mm, wow. Which is to say, Wells is born into the lower middle class. Father never has much money, keeps losing businesses and careers and aspirations. His mom tries the best that she can to keep the family together. Um, they lived in Bromley, another important aspect of Wells. Wells comes from the suburbs, right? He's not born into the English country estate. Mm -hmm. He is not even born into a major city. He's born into this new phenomenon, the suburb. The suburb. Uh, and that's a, a new thing of this period. Bromley is a kind of remote suburb. Like it's a suburb of a, it's an exurb of oh. London, very Southwest end of London. And so he's really not a part of the intellectual main thoroughfares of, of Victorian Britain. Yeah. There he is brought up in a small suburban community with a kind of narrow do well dad, mom who's a former maid, they managed to find to put together enough money to send him to school, which was a great thing for him. Um, but by and large, it's a very, very modest upbringing and not the upbringing at all that you would expect from somebody who would go on to have such a interesting and important career, both in science and in, uh, in literature. Wells has two breaks, two lucky breaks. Okay. One of them is an actual literal break. He breaks oh. his leg. When he's 12 years old, the little Herbert George Wells breaks his leg and he's laid up for months he was always kind of a sickly puny kid yeah um and so when he breaks his leg that's it he's out of school and laid up and he's in his bedroom for months on end and while he's there he starts reading books in his later career wells always accredited this a period where he was stuck in the house with nothing to do for many months and simply turned towards literature and particularly turns toward fiction with creating his imagination this is the period where he begins to live a kind of half imaginary life as well as he's living in the ordinary world. He's constantly living in this world that he imagines for himself. Wow. His other break is a more figurative break, uh, but in some sense is just equally as important. Wells was lucky enough to get a scholarship to the normal school of science. This is what will later be called uh, the Royal College of Science in South Kensington. Now it's called the Imperial College. So that's where he was. He went what we now call Imperial College London. In the 1870s, 1880s, this is a new thing, the normal school of science. And the normal school of science was an interesting uh, institution and an endeavor in its own right. So at this period of time, there are only two really major universities, Oxford and Cambridge, in England anyways. And those schools by and large, to a certain degree, basically focus on classical literature and theology and sometimes mathematics, but not a whole lot of science going on in the Oxbridge system of the time. During this period, particularly following Darwin's success with an origin of species, the people who were imagining the power and the value of science, and indeed of the importance of scientists to the culture as a whole, start to uh, entertain ideas about how they can help spread scientific education to the middle classes. And so they set up things like the normal school for science in London itself, and they give scholarships to working class kids. Oh. Wells gets one of those, one of those scholarships to the normal school uh, in South Kensington. And his teacher there, lucky enough for him, is Thomas Henry Huxley. Um, that might not be a name that's so well known today. I think people re remember, I think it's his great nephew, Aldous Huxley, who wrote Brave New World. Thomas Henry Huxley okay. was a close associate of Darwin's. It would be, Charlene, like if you went to, if you took a class at Assiniboine College, mm -hmm. you decided to take a biology class at Assiniboine, and you discovered Neil deGrasse Tyson was your teacher. Oh, okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. In other words, he shows up at this, uh, this scholarship school for, for poor kids yeah. and discovers that one of the major minds of his generation is his biology teacher. Oh. And Huxley has an enormous impact on, well, on the young Wells' life. Mm -hmm. um, Thomas Henry Huxley is sometimes best known as Darwin's bulldog. And he's called Darwin's bulldog because Darwin himself, after he published The Origin of Species, by and large retreated from the public uh, furor that his book ignited. It was beneath him to go out there and debate these things. 
it was Huxley who moved out into the public sphere and defended the origin of species, defended science, and promoted science as a new way of knowing the world that had to be increasingly answered to. So Huxley is a tremendously important figure, both as a scientist himself, he's a major theorist in, in his own right. He's yeah. an important educator and he established this school and he was Wells's biology teacher. At college. Wow. So which is to say the young Herbert George Wells gets evolutionary theory basically from the horse's mouth from the person closest to Darwin. And it has an enormous impact and you can see it on this novel. This novel is, for all intents and purposes, it is merely Huxley's lectures on evolution and ethics turned into a fiction. Wow, that's so interesting. I Because reading the novel, and I know we're just in chapters one and two, um, but you can really see there's um, real thought and, and, um, and science behind some of these things that it feels like there is. Um, definitely. So it's nice to know that it's, he's, he's got it backed up. Yeah, no, he's, he's not fooling around. Um, mm -hmm. What happened was, is that he finishes his studies at the normal school um, and he begins work as a journalist because there's no way he can become a real scientist. To be a real scientist, you would have gone to Oxford or, or Cambridge, right? You have to have, mm -hmm. and typically you, you were a gentleman, right? Uh, but he could be a popularizer of science in this new world of, of magazines and journals uh, and plays, this whole new opening world that's beginning to, to shape around print culture in the uh, mid to late 19th century. And so that's becomes his, uh, that becomes his, his entree as a writer. That's what I'm gonna do. I've got a great imagination. I know more about science than most kids my age know. And he's gonna remember, he's still, he's still quite young at this point. He's only in his 20s. Uh, and I'm going to put those two things together, my imagination with my training at, at the normal school of science. Um, and he's going to start in, with journalism. He starts writing these journalistic pieces that are essentially, like I said, Neil deGrasse Tyson before, mm -hmm. exactly like that, popularizing science. He's not doing the research, but he's able to explain it to a mass audience in magazines and newspapers that gives it a kind of readability. It makes it attractive and interesting um, and he can make them more understandable. So that's what he starts off as, as basically a science journalist. And The Time Machine is his first novel. Last year we did a, um, as a sidebar, um, we did a, a, a ghost story program using H.G. Mm. Wells's ghost stories, a few oh, of his early ghost stories, mm. um, which are, it, it seems like he's he's really exploring the ghost story theme, but they do tend to kind of shift into more of a scientific, you can see where his interest really lies. Yeah, he was a materialist, right? So, and as a materialist, his ghost stories are always going to eventually evaporate the paranormal element mm -hmm. and usher you into the possibility of a materialist explanation. The moth. Right. One of... Uh my favorite ones because it's not really it's kind of a ghost story but it is but it's not <laughs> it's a, right it's a possession right and so the, uh, the the phrase that gets gets used around wells during this period is, is maybe an interesting one for us to think about he didn't have a sense that he was writing science fiction that term doesn't exist yet mm -hmm, okay um it's a term that was uh coined in the 1920s and it was coined mostly by american editors who were publishing these kind of pulpy science, these kind of pulpy sensationalist tales of the future that were very technologically focused, ray guns and rocket ships and, and aliens. Um, and they were largely being sold to teenagers in the 1920s in these magazines called Astounding Sounds, et cetera. Um, when Wells was writing, there was no genre, there was no market, there was no separate category in the bookstore. There was no drop-down menu on Amazon for this particular kind of writing he was doing. Mm. And so it was usually called scientific romance, which is an interesting title in its own way, isn't it? Yeah. To think that he understood these as romances with a bit of science added to them. I don't even know what to think about that right now. I've never heard that term. Yeah. Oh, it's... And that would have been the phrase that was used in the late 19th century if they were going to kind of try and identify this emergent genre of what was essentially, you know, uh, like romances. So in the 19th century, a romance wasn't like the Harlequin romance. It wasn't sort of um, glamour stories of love. Right. In the 19th century, a romance is, is an exotic tale of adventure. Mm. 
an exotic tale yeah. of adventure, usually in a far-flung place, right? Yeah. Um, so there were imperial romances during this period about Africa and adventures in, in Africa. Yeah. And so what he was writing were scientific romances. Yes, they were thrilling adventure tales set in a far-flung place, but they had a kind of basis in logic and in well-established scientific theory, in fact. And so they were romances. They were they were they were imaginary and adventurous, and very much belonged to the world of fiction. And yet they were grounded in this other thing, fact and material materiality. And so they were kind of odd, almost odd bedfellows. A scientific romance, in some ways, is a contradiction in terms. And that's what Wells is trying to figure out. So, such an interesting guy. I'm gl- you know, it's a good thing that uh, he went into writing. Yeah, and went into writing at just this time. And he really is this kind of meeting place of all these different energies, right? The Mm -hmm. emergent middle class, the rise of science, the emergence of the new theory of origin of species, this fascination with history and time and geology. All this stuff kind of shapes this guy and he kind of puts it all together. That said, let's um, let's not take away from him what is in fact a pretty original, as far as I can tell, pretty original contribution. The idea that you could travel through time as a dimension in the same way that you could travel through the regular three dimensions of Euclidean geometry. I think that's his idea. Oh, so he might have been the originator of that kind there, of thing. There may have been other people obviously thinking about what it would mean. I mean it's such an odd, once you sort of set the logical question before a thinker, once you get to the point where time is a dimension, Okay, you're right, time is the fourth dimension. If that's the case, shouldn't you be able to move through time because we move through the other three dimensions? That, that is a pretty logical question. So what Wells does though, is construct a narrative out of what was basically a philosophical question. I see, yeah. Do you have anything else to tell us about H.G. Uh, Wells? Uh, well, that, that, that's not a bad way to sort of at least frame this part of, of our discussion, um, to understand that Wells was this lower middle class kid with a unlikely education in science, starts off as a journalist, but he wants to bring science to the world of romance. Mm-hmm. And the, the novel that we're reading together and listening to together is really that that coming together of all those different forces. Okay, I have something to say about uh, furniture design, but I want to oh. jump that um, to, to ask about because uh, I think it, it, it matches up better with what we were just talking about, is dinner parties and the people that who, who are at the dinner parties. So in the in the novel at the beginning, it's, it's kind of framed like the time traveler isn't the narrator. There is a narrator who goes to a dinner party and the time traveler is the host. At this dinner party, they have um, these nameless people, uh, the medical man, a psychologist, and the editor, and the journalist, and a, and a silent man, and a young man. I just, I just find it interesting to hear that H.G. Wells was kind of a lower middle class kid, and um, the novel really makes me think of, there was a lot, like the time traveler as kind of a upper class person, and all these people as more upper class um jobs like medicine and, and psychology and that he was kind of writing from this place of of being a lower middle class um, kind of person uh, but the question um, I have about the dinner party and the people involved are um, what do you think as a liter like a, a, the dinner party as a device to frame mm. the story uh, why do you think all of these different types of people who are nameless and they are just called by the tasks that they perform like what what do you think um, having all these people at the dinner party uh, kind of says and how, how, how does that kind of frame the story for us well that's the key word isn't it this is a frame narrative uh, and trying to understand the text uh, in light of its frame narrative will really help us appreciate um, the skill with which Wells puts this thing together. It's so easy to uh, forget that the whole of this novel takes place not in 802, 701 <laughs> AD, right. um, in this far flung future where a guy is struggling with Eloys and Morlocks. No, no, the whole novel takes place in a room not unlike the one that you're sitting in, a Victorian sitting room where a group of men have gathered to have dinner. And that, what we call a frame narrative, 
um, structures a lot of the thematic importance of the text as a whole. First, it, it may be useful just to understand what we mean by a frame narrative and think about why Wells would, would use a frame narrative. It's a fairly traditional literary technique. Um, you'll see it in other texts, you know, famously Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Heart of Darkness. These are all frame narratives. They are stories within stories. And any frame narrative in which a story is encrypted inside other stories has particular kinds of forces that it imposes onto the reader. Any frame narrative is going to always foreground the act of storytelling itself. Frame narratives are always about stories and telling of stories and the list because it's actually being dramatized. Here's a story in which a bunch of people show up at dinner and then listen to somebody else tell them a story. And so we are watching the act of narration and we can't help then but assume that the very fact of narration itself is one of the themes of any frame narrative, that what we're asked to think about is the telling of the story, mm. how the story is told, to whom it's told. Further, frame narratives structure our knowledge of the events in very specific ways. Where a typical omniscient narrator, once upon a time this happened from this kind of disembodied space of the objective narrator has this God's eye like view, the frame narrative does something very differently. Instead of offering you a certain knowledge of things as they actually happened, instead, we get these very subjective uh, recountings of things that they claim have happened, which are then passed on to someone else who then is passed it on to us. And so the reader is inscribed in the narrative. We too are on the receiving end. The same way that the narrator is hearing the, tra the time traveler tell the story, so too we are hearing the the narrator tell us the story mm -hmm. and the story itself the events of the story whatever happened in this world is never allowed to stand on its own it no longer has a kind of authority or stability as a thing in its own right that exists with a kind of objective certitude instead you're thrown into this much more uh, networked world of things moving between people in real time, negotiated, contested, rejected. That couldn't possibly have happened. I think it did. In Wells's case, that frame narrative is doing some, some interesting work. In the most obvious and, and most conventional sense, it's Wells's way of establishing verisimilitude, which is to say the truth factor of the story, the truthiness of the story. If this is merely a story that was recounted over a dinner party and he himself, the narrator, the Wells figure, can't really tell you whether or not it happened, then everything's sort of put at a distance and its reality or its lack of reality is sort of up to you to decide. And that's a very conventional, you'll know that from your ghost stories, mm -hmm. it's very, very conventional to say, well, I don't know if this really happened, but my friend told me this story. And that's one way to frame the fantastic, hmm. to create the fantastic as a question that maybe happened, but doesn't necessarily endorse it. And then that situates the narrator in a dependable place because the narrator's not saying this happened. The narrator's just saying, this is the story that was told to me. So you can still trust the narrator yeah. and it's up to you to decide what to do with what the narrator tells you. So that's a very conventional technique. Mm -hmm. I think Wells is doing something more with it though in, in this instance. And it has something to do with the kinds of uh, uh, figures that you have uh, rightly identified and cataloged for us as participating in this dinner scene. So what is this frame narrative? The frame narrative, as you rightly say, is a dinner scene in which a group of men, I think it's important, these are all men, have gathered together. I'll make this one little correction. They're not upper class. Okay, yeah. They are professional class. They're oh, all okay. middle-class professionals. None of these guys has a title. None of these guys, from what we can tell, comes from landed gentry. They're all guys not so different from Wells. Mm, okay, yeah. Middle-class people who have gone to school, because this is the period in which school is now becoming much more widely available to the middle class, and they have risen. And how did they rise? Through their own initiative, mm. through their own skill through what they learned, through their, through their courage, through their endeavor, through their energy. So these are these aspirational figures of middle-class success who've all gathered together and they're come to hear this other fellow, this time traveler, who's gonna tell this story of his 
aspirational growth. What he has done with his energy, with his courage, with his ability, with his skill. Mm. We, we know some interesting things about this time traveler. And maybe this, let's just get back to your earlier question about the chairs. Yeah, this is something I thought was really interesting. I don't know if other people will, but um, as you might have noticed in the first uh, few chapters, uh, the dinner guests come and they are seated in these really comfortable chairs that the time traveler has designed himself and uh, and made. And so um, it's just an interesting interesting detail. And yes, what, what can you tell us about? What are your thoughts on that? It's a good question, you know. Um... It is an odd thing. This is the this is the opening paragraph of the story, right? And so any opening has to do a lot of work, and the work that it has to do has to be very specific. So it's an odd detail for a writer to introduce in the first couple of sentences of a novel about time traveling this odd little fact: we were sitting on chairs that were super comfy, and that were the patents of the uh, of our host. What does this tell us? Why put this little detail in there? So what does it tell us? So it tells us that our time traveler can not only, apparently, we've already got the sense of that he's a guy who can do extraordinary things. The novel's called The Time Travel, called The Time Machine. He's called The Time Traveler. So he's apparently not only a guy who can do those sorts of things, he's a guy who can design chairs. That's interesting, isn't it? But the first thing we learn about this guy is that he can design chairs. And further, we know something about the chairs he designed. They are uh, unusually comfortable. Most other chairs, we're told, kind of impose themselves on you. But we're told that these chairs do the reverse. They kind of embrace you, is the phrase, the verb that, that Wells' narrator uses. So what do we know about our narrator then? He is a man of ingenuity a man who um, works across a number of different disciplines, working in time travel, and he's working in furniture design. Yeah. Uh, and it, it speaks that in every one of these situations, he is a, a kind of outsider. This is a kind of independent rogue thinker who brings his own oddball, loner, uh, 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 rebel-like uh, um, uh, uh, engagement with science to whatever he does. If he's going to design chairs, he's not going to design chairs the way anyone else does. He's going to design his own chair, and they're going to be better than anybody else's. Right. So that when we discover that he's also developed a way of d traveling through time, well, we're somewhat prepared for it. Mm. So what do we know about him? He is, um, Im importantly, he is a independent, non-aligned, non-professional dabbler in a variety of different artistic and scientific areas of, uh, of activity. And that he works as easily in chair design as in theoretical physics. And that whatever he brings to those things is his own oddball, rogue attitudes. He's gonna design chairs differently, and when he encounters the problem of time as a fourth dimension, he's not gonna bow down before the dogma of received knowledge. He's gonna do his own thing. He's gonna travel through time. Right. And we already know that because of those chairs. Okay, wow. Then they were important. They are, I think that is an interesting detail. I think it's not, it's not an accidental detail. It at least establishes his character, that he's a guy who moves in different disciplines, and that whatever discipline he works in, he's successful but he's also uh, an independent thinker when it comes to each of those disciplines that he works within. Yeah, he's got his own system. He's got his own way. He's got his own take on everything, and he doesn't care what other people think. Mm -hmm. We don't need to sit on uncomfortable Victorian chairs. Yeah. We can sit on comfortable ones. Um, so this is just a follow-up question about the chairs. Mm -hmm. Because he's this designer as well as being a scientist, and he makes other things that we will see, he is also an explorer, which, um, well, people might get it. It's called the time machine and he's the time traveler. He explores time. We have Wells linking these things um, together. So mm. the design uh, quality of his personality and using his own system. Is this kind of, is this a thing that the Victorians like to do? Um, is have, have a link between um, uh, speculative speculative things like like time travel and, and practical things like like designing furniture right so one of the things that we should should note here um is that our time traveler 
this independent thinking kind of rogue uh, figure who only follows his, his own whims and interests, he's an amateur. He's not a professional, nor is he a specialist. Okay. And in the 19th century, that is uh, the idea of the amateur explorer, the amateur scientist. We might today feel a little suspicious. He's only an amateur. Why, why should we listen to that person? But in the 19th century, that's a very positive marker. So, for example, Sherlock Holmes is an amateur detective. And that's part of why Holmes is a figure we can trust. He doesn't accept money. In the 19th century, accepting money for things mm, always carries with it a certain suspicion that the services you're providing are simply provided because of the money. Clearly, the time traveler is not motivated by money. He is the amateur gentleman who works outside specialist knowledge, works outside institutions. He's not the... Um, died in the wool, dogmatic, ordinary clerk or uh, technocrat. He's always this kind of outsider coming to these different areas of endeavor. And when he comes to those areas of endeavor, he brings a kind of artistic sensibility. He's not just the scientist or just the technocrat or just the, the information specialist. He makes a beautiful time machine. He yeah. makes a beautiful chair. So like Holmes, who could play the violin as well as he could play, as well as he could uh, perform his uh, feats of scientific deduction, so too our time traveler hmm. is this interesting combination of artist and scientist. Outside figure who's coming inside of these worlds that are fairly well established, these bodies of knowledge that are well established and upending them because he doesn't take anything at face value. He'll, he's only interested in pursuing his own end and he's pretty sure that his own end is better than everybody else's. So he's a very Holmesian figure, I, I would say, mm -hmm. in that sense. And, and let's remem remember that. So Holmes is, first Holmes story is what, 1886, 87? This is 95. So this is, Holmes is eight years earlier. And he's clearly kind of playing with that kind of figure. Holmes is a scientist, science of deduction. Mm -hmm. He's an amateur gentleman scholar who follows his own areas. He's kind of oddball, he's kind of an irascible character. Mm -hmm. All that's true uh, of the time, uh, the time traveler as well. Um, so he's that scientist figure and he's this amateur gentleman figure. 